Welcome to our podcast, Psychiatric Services from Pages to Practice. In this podcast, we highlight new research or columns published this month in the journal Psychiatric Services. I'm Lisa Dixon, editor of Psychiatric Services, and I'm here with our podcast editor and my co host, Josh Berezin. Hey, Josh. Hey, Lisa. I'm excited for our first episode. Me too. Today, we're going to talk about three articles uh, from the journal that have been recently published online. We'll take an inside look into medication management visits, discuss outcomes for forensic act teams, and talk about changes in autonomy with first episode psychosis treatment. That all sounds good to me. Let's start with Johnson Quachka's article on first person perspectives on prescriber service user relationships in community mental health centers. They conducted qualitative interviews of 44 service users and 25 prescribers from a subsample of a larger study involving 15 community mental health centers. So they wanted both parties to describe the basic elements of a medication management. For the prescribers, they asked what their goals were for the visits and also their general experience with the patients. For the service users, they asked about their overall experience at the clinic and their relationship with the provider. Before we dive into the results, what, um, what are CMHCs and what role do they have in the public mental health system? Sometimes the simplest questions are the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> CMHCs have a long history, uh, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to spare you that history and just really talk about today really community mental health centers are the agencies that provide outpatient mental health care to individuals with serious mental illnesses who are covered by public insurance or no insurance. So these are really the basic front lines of community mental health. Right, right. And, you know, so when we look at these medication management sessions from the perspective of the uh, prescribers uh, and the perspective of consumers, we're really looking at a big portion of the day-to-day practice of community psychiatry. So with that in mind, let's dive into their results. They found that the typical appointment focused on medications, symptom reduction, and side effect management. Prescribers were frustrated with time constraints, no big shock there. When they asked about the relationship, most service users had neutral or positive opinions about the prescribers and were satisfied with their care. But the relationship wasn't particularly meaningful or important. So I was particularly struck by the author's point about how the system has created kind of like low expectations for what constitutes good care. And I think this is probably a complaint that's not limited to psychiatry, but it seems like you know, by the nature of our field, we should be able to do a little bit better. Was this your take home too? I thought this study was really interesting and, and will resonate uh, with many of our readers. It resonated with me in that I, I've worked at a community mental health center uh, for many, many years. For most of my career, I've had uh, a, a small community mental health center practice. And I guess I was struck by what I sort of call the primacy of neutrality, that like the lack of negative being the best that we could do. And, you know, I think in some sense, there was an appreciation by all parties, by the prescribers, uh, by the patients, that the limited time, maybe 15 or 20 minutes per session, and the need, you know, to address very, very important substantive medication issues, side effects, certainly, I mean, you can't, as a, as a prescriber, whether you're a nurse practitioner, or PA, or as a, as a physician. There are things you just have to get you, through. Exactly. And, um, and so those requirements, given a limited time, I think left even the best intentioned uh, participants in the interaction with limited options. And I got a sense from both sides that, that everyone was actually trying to do their best and that there was an appreciation of that. But in the end, it was really lacking because we all know that in order to get the best outcomes and to help people be as satisfied as possible with their lives, we can't take the medication issue and the medication decisions outside of the person's entire life and just kind of just focusing on this kind of the narrow parameters of symptoms and side effects is really going to leave a lot of wellness at the table. So it's, it's troubling. It's, it's troubling. I mean, I think there's some good news here in the sense that I think there's a lot of positive will. There's a sense that there's at least some benefit and advantage that patients are getting from having access to medications and to their, to their prescribers. But it's also disturbing uh, because we can do so much better if we could somehow realign 
the treatment system so that we're we're working all of these programs and and the participants are working as a team. So was this uh, similar to your experience working in CMHCs? Did this resonate for you? I think it did somewhat in the sense that there was always a frustration with with limited time. But I had a really unique experience in that I worked on an ACT team uh, that served homeless adults with mental illness and then I was able to follow those clients when once they um, no longer needed the intensity of act services into the clinic and so they had kind of continuity of care with me as their doctor when they were with act and then with me in the in the clinic so you had already established a relationship with these people and it kind of in that light 15 to 20 minutes takes on a whole new sort of because a lot of the nonverbal communication you can just sort of tell if something's going wrong and skip to the important part and really get at things that are important in people's lives exactly and I already had a sense of who they were beyond their symptoms and side effects and so that's why I talked about creating a team and having the physician or prescriber be a part of that team which the patient can fully appreciate so that you can really bring in relevant issues into the dialogue. So this paper really gives us a sense of where we are and where we need to go. Next up we have Jay, Stephen, Lamberti and colleagues, a randomized controlled trial of the Rochester Forensic Assertive Community Treatment Model. So you've had a lot of experience working with ACT teams. Why is the regular ACT not enough for a forensic population? I mean, this is already a pretty, um, pretty intensive intervention. Yeah, ACT is intensive. It, it's multidisciplinary. It's multi-element. It takes place in the community. And we know from a large body of research on ACT teams that it is very successful at reducing hospitalization. We know it's very successful at promoting housing stability. But in spite of the fact that a large percentage of people who are referred to ACT have criminal justice problems and histories, ACT doesn't really do anything to help with that. So, so it really makes sense to try to improve on ACT to help our clients with these problems. So they need like a super ACT. Exactly. Um, and they pointed out four very particular things that they consider as keys to a successful forensic ACT team. Yeah, and, and I, I want to emphasize that these investigators really worked hard, they talked to people, they reviewed the literature to come up with these four different factors. The first is to start with a high fidelity act team with criminal justice savvy staff. So we're really starting with, with the best. Then what they did was they required the teams to identify and address risk factors for criminal recidivism. So these are the criminogenic risk factors that everyone's talking about. Yeah, yeah. So again, just trying to really identify people's vulnerabilities and help them with that. The third thing that they did was they used legal authority to promote engagement rather than punishment. So you know, if the judge is in a position to make a decision if someone has violated one of their requirements, Get them back into treatment. Don't put them in jail. And finally, they collaborated with criminal justice agency representatives, judges, as I've already said, probation or parole officers, police officers, and pretrial service workers. So really bringing the whole team, the whole criminal justice team, together to help the client. This sounds good, so the question is, does it work? Um, that's what they looked at. They randomized 70 people with psychotic disorders charged with misdemeanors, either to this gold standard forensic act model that you just described, or an enhanced treatment as usual. And then they looked at the outcomes. So what they found is that those who got the forensic act intervention had fewer total convictions and days in jail. They had fewer hospitalization days in the hospital and just fewer hospitalizations in general. And they also had more outpatient treatment contacts and days in the outpatient treatment. That's right, and it's a good summary. I have to say that I think that this is an impressive and really important study, and I really appreciated how they pointed out that it's not just the diversion, not just the keeping people in the community, not just getting the judges to promote engagement. That was all important, but they also made the point that the teams then had to build on this access to the patients and this time with the patients to provide good treatment. So for example, the FAT clinicians received training in CBT for people with antisocial personality disorders and they optimized the clinical care's ability to focus on these issues. And so in some ways the diversion plus good treatment may be the key. 
So it's really two things. And the diversion piece, as they point out, really requires this cooperation between the criminal justice system and the judges and the mental health system, which are two systems that aren't always kind of in agreement in their goals and their backgrounds and mm-hmm. where they're coming at things. Mm-hmm. But this study, I think, really highlights that when this is working well, and I think you really have to have committed systems on both sides, but when it's working, it can actually really make a difference in individual people's Mm -hmm. lives and trajectories. So I'm curious to hear what you think the next steps are in, uh, in research in this area. Well, this was a relatively small pilot study done in one location, so it needs replication. All right, we'll uh, stay tuned. To wrap things up today, we have Julia Brown and colleagues' study on perceived autonomy support in the NIMH RAISE Early Treatment Program. So this is part of the Navigate study, correct? Yep, that's that's the same study. And so I know that the original study found that Navigate reduced symptoms and improved quality of life compared to usual care. This is a big, important study, and I just want you to walk us through the basics of the Navigate program. Sure. It was really a tremendous study, and the Navigate program is really the premier example of of a coordinated specialty care program, which is now considered the evidence-based approach for young people with first-episode psychosis. So what is Navigate? What is coordinated specialty care? Well, it includes uh, psychopharmacologic treatment, and Navigate used a support system, a decision support system called COMPASS, It includes family support and psychoeducation. It includes supported employment and education, case management, and finally, the psychotherapy, the form of psychotherapy that Navigate includes is called individual resiliency therapy. This is another comprehensive wraparound intervention. Exactly. Where does autonomy fit into all of this? Autonomy, it seems like this kind of soft variable. What is it really? How important is it? Well, It's actually, I think, when you start to work with these young people, it's so critical. Autonomy means the ability to act out of personal choice. And as we think about what these young people are dealing with who have developed this illness that's terrifying, that can really challenge their sense of self, it can challenge their families' trust in them. And so what autonomy, in some ways autonomy can be considered almost central to this notion of helping these young people to grab a hold of their illness, to own their illness, to own their treatment, and to make choices about their lives that are, that conform to their goals and that conform, you know, to really their, their situation. So supporting autonomy isn't like a particular thing they're doing. It really infuses the entire model of care. Exactly, exactly. And I was intrigued by this. So I went and I spoke to Dr. Kim Muser, who's one of the architects of uh, the Navigate model. And and he emphasized a couple of things. He said, autonomy supports uh, begins by establishing a respectful collaborative relationship with the person, helping them explore what their goals and desires are, conveying support and the belief that they can actually make progress toward the goals they have, and then providing assistance and treatment options that the person can choose from to help achieve these goals. So, you know, part of autonomy is also giving people good choices from which they can choose. Mm -hmm. If you're just choosing from a menu of bad options, what's the point of autonomy? Yeah, or it may be harder to really obtain a sense of autonomy if you're in a situation where you you, you don't feel like you have any good choices. You don't want to do any of those things. Exactly. So what Brown and colleagues did is they looked at a couple questions related to autonomy using a scale developed to measure people's perceptions of how well providers supported that autonomy. So the first question was, do people getting the Navigate intervention perceive more autonomy support than the treatment as usual group? And then second, are increased scores on this autonomy scale associated with improved quality of life and symptom reduction? So the other variable in all of this is time. Their three main findings were that perceived autonomy scores increased over two years in the Navigate group, but not in the community care group. And they also found that increased autonomy scores were associated with improved quality of life and improved symptoms. Yeah, that, I think that sums it up. And I think that this study is important because it underscores 
that what m what may be a critical ingredient in the benefits of coordinated specialty care. Of course, you know we don't know that for sure, but you know how can we work with people to own their treatment and be an active part of their care? Mm -hmm. And you know sometimes I think we get too focused on associations between what more sort of traditional outcomes. And you know it's great when symptoms improve and functioning improves and people are better able to achieve their goals, but. I think autonomy, this idea that autonomy is an outcome in and of itself, it's, it's like really important. And that's something that I think we should be shooting for in, in all of our patients, first episode or not. Yeah. In some sense, if you have autonomy, self-efficacy, it, it can be the tool or the sense of self that can help people deal with the next crisis or the next challenge. I mean, I don't think of these things as either or. We want to help people reduce their symptoms. We want to help people achieve their goals. And, and wouldn't it be great if then as a part of that, we give them the tools such as autonomy and self-efficacy to handle whatever life has to throw at them. This is like a teach a man to fish sort of thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll end on that positive note. We invite you to visit our website, ps.psychiatryonline.org to read the articles we discussed in this episode, as well as other great research. We also welcome your feedback. Please email us at psjournal at psych.org. I'm Lisa Dixon. And I'm Josh Berzin. Thank you for listening. We will talk to you next time.